Hi, this is Levi. Before we get into this episode, I wanted to take a quick minute to introduce a few of the other podcasts in the WCF Podcast Network. Tom and Naomi are exploring how we interact in our ecclesial relationships in From the Platform. It's a very in-depth series that is incredibly helpful for understanding and developing compassion and better listening practices. That's From the Platform. Sam Taylor from Cleveland, Ohio, produces weekly devotionals in Pause to Consider. Think uh, Mr. Rogers meets uh, Fireside Chat. I love Sam's humble style and think every episode is fantastic. You can find both of those wherever you get your podcasts or on our website at wcfoundation.org. Now, here's the show. Welcome back to A Little Faith. This is a podcast sponsored by the Williamsburg Christadelphian Foundation. A Little Faith podcast explores both the challenges and hope of living a life of faith. I'm Steve, and I'm here with one of my favorite people, Karim Ram. I've known Karim for a long time, and it's really lovely to be back in the UK sitting in his living room. We're going to be talking about how our faith should be something that is beyond religion. Karim is going to talk about how faith is a very, very powerful thing, but it comes with great personal and social responsibilities. We're going to be looking at how our challenge is to be up close and personal with God, beyond religion. Are you saying that religion religion is not a good idea? Religion is a bad thing. Religion is Karl Marx. What did he say? Uh, maybe it wasn't Marx, it was Lenin, one of those guys. So that's the opiate of the people. That's not what you're getting at. N- no. Um, Richard Dawkins said that many of us saw religion as harmless nonsense. But September the 11th changed all of that. Okay. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and I th- actually think that that's quite a powerful point, mm-hmm. that the people who attacked the Twin Towers were men of religion, they were men of faith, and that actually when they did that in a ironic sort of way, they fulfilled something that Jesus once said, that if you had faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be that cast into the sea. You could say to this building. Yeah. Fall down. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, faith is a very, very powerful thing. And in the wrong hands, it's a very dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. That's really the point. Religion is often a cause of conflict between people. It fuels suspicion. It fuels a distrust of the other. You know, often religious people divide the world into those who are in their group and those who are not in their group. And religious people don't always ask critical questions about their faith. Mm -hmm. Um, They confuse religion and politics and culture together. They, They sort of lump them all together, you know. So they think that because, for instance, they're they have a certain way of life and they've always done certain things. Therefore, what may just be cultural, in a sense, becomes invested with, you know, religious significance. So, for instance, the Brits were often very keen on punctuality. Punctuality was seen as a virtue. I still think it is. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a Brit. (laughs) You know, but it's, um, you know, I mean, how did uh, people in the Bible manage punctuality before the invention of the watch? You know, it's just a it's just a, a cultural construction. And obviously, if we look at some of the conflicts that happen in the world, so for instance, uh, the conflicts in in Israel, you know, those are conflicts to do with territory, politics, but also religion too. Yeah, so there, there's an example of where these things all sort of mix together. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Religion can make people feel better than that there are other than other people. Yeah. Yeah. And religions can use guilt, fear, and promise of rewards in the afterlife um, in order to manipulate their members, as in the, as was the case with the 
those guys who attacked the Twin Towers. They believed that they would have whatever reward it was that they, you know, conceived of, you know, in heaven for doing what they did. And the question that sort of preoccupies me more and more the older I get, is organised religion really about God? Or is it really about maintaining a community mm-hmm. and about identity? You know, this is what we are. We're Christadelphians. Right. You know, and being Christadelphian is more important than actually being the children of God mm-hmm. or being followers of Jesus Christ. And then the other thing, and this takes us back to the Twin Towers again, those guys who did that thought that by doing that, they would die and go to heaven. So in other words, for them, life was just a waiting room for something else. Mm-hmm. People have often referred to ISIS and, uh, you know, the group that, those, that, that group that those guys were a part of, Al-Qaeda, uh, as being a death cult. Mm-hmm. But I think that that charge could be laid at the feet of all religion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember you said that. Yeah. Uh, Christadelphianism is... Maybe a death cult. Yeah, simply because we're waiting for the kingdom to come. Being here isn't important. But that's not a biblical view. You know, Moses said to Israel, he said, I say before you life and death, choose life. Because being here now is being in the presence of God. What could be more profound than that, than being alive? So some of these um, criticisms of religion are quite old. Uh, Jesus' parable of the... Uh, the Pharisee and the publican, I think, sort of very pithily illustrates the the us and them attitude that I talked about earlier. That you know, earlier on, we can simplistically divide the world into the good guys and the bad guys, but we're always the good guys, aren't we? Yes, we are. We are. We are always the good guys, and the Pharisee enumerates all of his good deeds, you know, and Paul would say. Don't be wise in your own conceits. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly what he is being. He's sort of saying that because I do this, therefore I am deserving of God's favour. He feels that God is obligated to him in some way. But that, that view, that view that the Pharisee articulates about himself and obviously the Pharisees by implication, is, I think, just a a very powerful example, as in the case of Al-Qaeda and ISIS, of groupthink, in which um, certain views of the world and attitudes become legitimate, they become okay, uh, and they become normalised. But to anyone who's outside that group, so for instance, we're not members of ISIS or Al-Qaeda, and we're obviously not Pharisees either, to us those attitudes are just bizarre or they're immoral. But groupthink actually is a very deeply ingrained human thing. That's how societies and communities have cohesion. But religious communities, I think, are, are very susceptible to it, in, in often in negative ways, because often what you get are bizarre, outlandish attitudes, beliefs and practices, they develop because the the group is based on a belief system anyway and it wants to maintain a sense of its its own uh, identity, a sense of its privilege at all costs. We are special. We have the truth. And because we have the truth, we are in God's favour. But, I mean, I don't know the details of the way that those guys in ISIS or Al-Qaeda thought i don't i don't understand or you know i don't know the details of their world view but i do know that their world view was the most extreme manifestation of groupthink and in contrast to that in the the parable of the the pharisee and the publican you have the um the publican and all he can say to god is god be merciful to me a sinner mm-hmm. yeah and, and I think that that's a really subversive and terrifying point because in that parable that Jesus tells, and remember that the Pharisees represented the you know, popular ideas of piety within Judaism. You know, Paul said, didn't he, later on, of the straightest sect of our religion, I was a Pharisee. Okay? But in this parable that Jesus tells of the Pharisee and the publican, it isn't the religious man who is right with God. 
It's a sinner. And, and wouldn't it be ironic if we ourselves were excluded from God's approval only to find some ordinary Joe whose life had broken down and had come to God in a state of desperation was actually more acceptable to God than we were? You know, what are we doing and why are we doing? And, and is it what God wants us to do anyway? But the problem with groupthink is that it, it conditions us into thinking that whatever the group thinks is important is important. And um, if all there are these, all these people are thinking the same thing, absolutely, together, yeah. Then how can we be wrong? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so groupthink itself isn't any guarantee that what we're doing is what God wants us to do. Is uh, there a red flag that hey, maybe we aren't because we're thinking we have this group mentality? I think we should always be. We should always be asking questions. And um, I think we need to be taking what Jesus actually says, you know, quite seriously. I mean, for instance, so just an example of this. Jesus says, when you, when you throw a feast, don't invite your friends, you know. Uh, but the most natural thing in the world is to invite our friends. So the natural instinct is to, is to go with groupthink and, um, for lack of a better phrase, um, to conform to the group. And it makes you feel better than two because you're yeah. in a group. Yeah, and it gives you a sense of identity, right. which is the identity politics thing again, you know, that we feel part of something. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, in Jesus' time, because obviously um, Judea and Galilee were under Roman occupation, the whole group thing, thing was probably much, much more of a powerful thing because they were under occupation. They were... You know, there was an existential threat. Enemy, yeah, yeah, right. yeah which, which always creates, um, you know, it's us and them, isn't it? Right. Yeah. yeah. But that was the context in which, that was exactly the context in which Jesus preached the, um, the Sermon on the Mount. A context in which you had groups of people who were trying to tip the balance of the world in their own favour. And they felt... That God was on their side because of their history, because of the Old Testament. You know, if anything, um, the Old Testament is, as we were saying earlier on, salvation history. Um, And so they felt that God should act for them, and that's what they were looking for. And we, we, you know, we know something about the, the history of first century Judea and Galilee from the history books and the various leaders that arose you know trying to trying to deal with the roman question but the um but the interesting thing is is that um even though within judaism there was no separation between religion and politics and they could probably more justifiably mobilize religion in favor of their their aspirations for liberation you know mm-hmm. um because obviously the foundational event for israel in the old testament was um, was the Exodus, wasn't it? You know? Okay. And that was commemorated every year when they kept Passover. You know, it was a story of liberation. So why shouldn't God act again to liberate them from the oppression of the Romans? That's what they wanted more than anything else. Mm-hmm. And so they could, they could sort of justifiably sort of think that, um, you know, that their, their aspirations for, uh, for freedom from the Romans had a religious dimension to it, you know. But the interesting thing is, is that even set against that highly volatile and, and sort of febrile background, Jesus refused to be drawn on the Roman problem. Mm. Um, and of course, it was a highly, you know, it was a highly sensitive question, wasn't it? And they tried to draw him, obviously, by asking him about mm. whether it was appropriate to pay taxes to Caesar or not. But Jesus, so Jesus doesn't criticise um, the Romans or or Herod or Pilate. You know, he doesn't he doesn't do any of that. In fact, he says to Pilate, "You would have no power over me if it hadn't unless it you from above." So. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Jesus was critical, though, very critical of of people who represented popular ideas of religious piety. Mm-hmm. Those were the people that Jesus was critical of. Mm. 
and his criticisms were actually quite cutting and strident. So he wasn't interested in politics, right? right? He's interested in behaviour. He's interested in, in, in piety, in our relationship with God. Mm-hmm. Now, then that's the issue, isn't it? It's, it's about Israel's relationship with God, both on a national level and obviously on an individual level. He's not interested in politics at all. He's interested in whether people had a genuine, real, bona fide relationship with God. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, it's quite clear that Jesus is a reformer of Judaism. Mm-hmm. He's trying to bring the Jews back into an authentic relationship with God rather than one that was just based on formalism or rituals or whatever, or mm-hmm. on nothing, in fact. Um, and, and I think that one of the most consistent statements that we have in... Um, in the Gospels of Jesus's, Jesus's criticisms of the Pharisees is obviously Matthew 23. And, um, I mean, we could go through, you know, each of the woes, but there's eight of them, which are obviously meant to be a parallel to the, the Beatitudes, to the blessings. But I think some of them are, some of them are, some of them are interesting to think about. And I'm not going to read the verses, but... So, for instance, he, you know, he says to them, you know, you... Um, you're not interested in the kingdom of God, in the sovereignty of God. And, um, you know, you, you, you prevent those people who are interested, you know, from, from entering therein. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the terms that we're talking, we might sort of say, well, you know, it isn't enough to insist that the kingdom of God is just the promise of real estate in the kingdom or indeed the promise of beautiful women in heaven. Mm-hmm. Because what's the difference? The question is the sovereignty of God. Mm. And were they subject to it? Are we subject to it now? Were they interested in God's in God or in or in God's will? Or had their their religion just been, you know, conflated with a nationalistic aspiration? Was was that all it was? Mm. You know, this is almost like the going back into the Old Testament again and, you know, give us a king desire you know where is god in all of this and then you know jesus criticizes them for using good works as a way of blindsiding and exploiting people and that's an old religious problem Mm -hmm. and we've seen a lot of that over the last 20 years of people using you know good works as a way of of you know you know, so we've had cases here in the UK where, you know, one particular individual did a lot of charity work, mm-hmm. but um, but used it as a way as a cover to for for abusing children. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. but if we think about some of the other churches where things like that have been rampant, they do it under the cover of piety, don't they? Yeah. How how could this person possibly be doing that? Mm-hmm. Because he's a he's a good man. He's a religious man. Whatever is going through their head is justifying. Too. Absolutely. Line, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. And then Jesus says um, later on in Matthew twenty three, he says, "You can compa- you compass sea and land to make one proselyte." You know, what are we working for, and, and are we actually doing anything that's worthwhile? Mm. You know, is it what God wants? If all we're doing is exerting our energy and trying to change the world around us, is this just a way of avoiding ourselves? Mm. The problem with Jesus is that he's too radical. He blows the covers off religion completely and utterly. Mm. Another point that Jesus makes in Matthew 23 is the obsession that we have with arcane distinctions. Uh, Arcane in the sense of academic distinctions, Mm. which are often not only meaningless, you know, when he talks about, you know, you know, uh, swearing by the altar or the gold that's on the altar. That's that's the verse I'm thinking of. Uh, often these distinctions are not only meaningless, but often, more importantly than that, they're actually corrosive to the human spirit. If that's how we learn to think, then we are really, really missing the point as far as Jesus is concerned. Um, yeah, and we and it just becomes. Yeah, a process manual in which we, it just doesn't do anything. Also in Matthew 23, he talks about them, um, 
you know, uh, tithing mint and cumin and omitting the weightier matters of the law. Yeah, that's a big one, isn't it? Not, you know, failing to apprehend that the real issues are to do with mercy and justice and faith and that these are not to be confused with our own custom and practice. And um, one of the things that we have to understand is that not everything is the same in Scripture. Some things are definitely more important than others. You know, there is a hierarchy of things in Scripture, and we have to, to understand that some things have to be given much, much more weight. Mm -hmm. Jesus criticises them, uh, the Pharisees for their obsession um, with surfaces, of faking it until they make it. Make it. Um, it's, you know, the gospel is radical. It's about being changed from the inside, which changes us on the outside. But if, if, if religion is just about how we appear to other people, then, of course, it's only ever going to be about surfaces, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, and then Jesus goes on to say, or make a point that, you know, where he talks about the fact that they cleaned um, the outside of the platter, but not the inside, that there is obsession with respectability, with fitting in with the group, meant that hypocrisy was the culture. Mm -hmm. Hypocrisy is the culture often in religion. I make no apology for saying that mm -hmm. because respectability is one of the most overrated virtues. Oh, it's the th people pursue what other people think about me. Absolutely. Rather than, natural. rather than what does God think of me. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because these people are here present right now God, I can't see. Yeah, Jesus said, didn't he, in John's Gospel, he said, I know you. You don't have the love of God in you. Yeah. You know, you receive honour one from another. How can you receive the honour that comes from God? It's a very, very human thing. Mm. But then I think the biggest one, which he leaves right until the end, is the one to do with the fact that they were the, they were the children of those who murdered the prophets. And, and here's, the, here's the really troubling thing that the people who should have been the upholders of the truth were actually its destroyers. And we have to ask ourselves the same question. They could celebrate the righteous and the prophets in death, but they couldn't abide them in real life. I think those are really, really penetrating and cutting criticisms. And I, and I think that they're, they're very resonant within the context of today. Um, the way that religion is co-opted and abused. I mean, obviously, we could apply it to our own community, but, you know, we may not be the worst offenders. Um, I don't know any Christadelphians who've flown aeroplanes into the sides of buildings or indeed killed anyone in the name of religion, which, which uh, may that always be the case. But, um, but I do think that these words of Jesus have a lot to say about the state of religion today, and, and the state of identity politics and the way that religion is mobilised as, as part of all of that. The story of Matthew's Gospel really is the story of Reformation. Jesus is attempting to reform Judaism. And the thing about Reformations is that Reformations don't, as we found with Martin Luther King, they don't start off by sort of saying, well, you know, I'm against this or I'm against that. They always start with a vision. I have a dream. And that's the way that Jesus' Reformation started too. A Reformation not just of what the world should be like, but of what we should be like. And that's why Jesus' ministry starts with the Beatitudes. In, right off the bat, sorry, Sermon on the Mount. It, six, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, and why Matthew 23, Jesus' denunciation of the Pharisees, is the bookend of his public ministry. Mm. So the Beatitudes start with the vision of what we should be like, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, etc., 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 and then you've got the eight woes in Matthew twenty-three, which are the other bookend of his ministry. And let's be brutally frank about the Beatitudes. Jesus is telling us the Beatitudes. The first one, the poor in spirit, the blessing is for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The last Beatitude, number eight, is blessed are those who are, are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Mm -hmm for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Mm. The same blessing, 
for the first and for the last one and indicates that the underlying blessing for all of these, whether they're poor in spirit, whether they are those that mourn, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, um, the meek, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, you know, the persecuted for righteousness sake. The underlying blessing for all of these is that these people are the recipients of God favor, God's favour and that they are the ones who are subjects of the kingdom. Mm-hmm. Okay? And, and I would argue that the, that the real context for the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 23. The woes that we've just talked mm-hmm. about. Because what the Pharisees practiced was just fake religion. And what Jesus is talking about, and the underlying current, that one of the underlying currents that runs through the Sermon on the Mount, is what a genuine life with God actually looks like. You know, Jesus talks about salt and light after the Beatitudes. He's talking about authenticity. Are we the real deal? And then he goes on to talk about um, how that affects the way that we relate to each other, about the way that we you know, about things like anger, you know, the way that we look at each other, uh, the way that we speak to each other, about privileging the other, turning the other cheek, about loving even our enemies. So that that becomes the next section of what what he's talking about. And then after that, we've got his section on the practice of religion, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, Um, the fact that it isn't about public performance, And those things that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 6 are the very thing that the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18 in the parable of the Pharisee are the very things that he picks up. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is consciously addressing those things in Matthew chapter 6 and saying, well, when you pray, don't make a public performance out of it. When you fast, you know, wash your face. Don't look as though you're fasting. Don't let anybody know you're doing it. Yeah, and when you're giving to the when you're giving alms, don't let your right hand know what your left is doing. Mm-hmm. You know, so these are these are you know there's a very consistent view here in in what Jesus is saying, but it's very much what he has at the back of his mind is the the hypocrisy, the play acting of the Pharisees. Uh, you know, and 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 the fact that they obviously represented piety in the minds of ordinary people yeah. and jesus is saying no that's not enough mm-hmm. yes so i mean that's that's basically a um a run through um the sermon on the mount we've just had very quickly there but but the point is is that these are the people that god favors okay and jesus says in matthew chapter five seventeen, don't think that i've come to destroy the law law and the prophets i haven't come to destroy but i've come to make them full and so Jesus was aware that the people who were listening to him wouldn't actually recognize what he was saying. Because for them, religion was all of that, everything that the Pharisees represented. It was all to do with temples, it was all to do with rituals, it was all to do with externals. Right. Clothing and the Ab- Absolutely. And I think a just. A uniform that showed I was pious. Yeah, and this this need to fit in with the group. Like a nice suit and a tie. Yeah, this group think thing. Yeah, well, everybody else is doing it. Why shouldn't I do it? What's wrong with it? Yeah. Yeah. And so Jesus was aware that his message, stressing a direct relationship with God without all of this other stuff, without recourse to national identity, etc., 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 would appear to be so radical as to appear to be unrecognisable. And that's why it was beyond religion, because it was about a personal relationship with the Father. Yeah. I think there were two things at least which, well, probably more. I mean, being human is the biggest one, of course. Um, we have very short attention spans. And, of course, this is wasn't just a problem that was peculiar to Jesus' day. I mean, we could go back into the pages of the Old Testament to look at Isaiah or Amos or any one of the prophets and see the same issues cropping up in various forms again. But, of course, the, the pressing thing was the, the existential threat, you know, that was there before them in the form of the Roman occupation. And they had a sense of privilege as a people because they obviously 
they saw themselves as the covenant people. You know, they saw themselves as, you, you know, there was a sense of exceptionalism, that we are the people of the covenant. Right. We are, yeah. And so, and so that, you know, forgive the phrase, trumped everything. And that's not a deliberate play on words there. So for them, you know, God became a means to an end. And the problem is, is that we treat God as a means to an end as well. Mm-hmm. You know, you ask people about, you know, what it is that they want about the kingdom and they'll tell you this, that and the other. The kingdom is only about one thing. It's about being with God. Mm-hmm. And the thing that comes over very clearly from, um, from the example of Christ himself, particularly in John's gospel, I think, is that sense of, of personal communion that he had with the Father. Which if you think about the way that, you know, Jesus, particularly here in the Sermon on the Mount, but obviously it's developed then in other parts of the New Testament, that idea of being the children of God, you know, it should be important to us in a very personal and very powerful way. It obviously was to him, you know. You, you, there's an incident, isn't there, in Matthew's Gospel when um, the Jews ask Peter, and they say, oh, does, does, your, does your master pay, does he pay the tax? Peter had to go after Jesus and say, do we pay the tax? Well, you know, well, actually, Jesus stopped him. <laughs> and, he said, and Jesus said to him, he said, oh, Simon Peter, you know, what, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of whom, of whom do the kings of the earth take tribute? From strangers or from children? And, um, you know, Peter sort of says, well, from strangers. And the, the implication of the question, obviously, is, well, why are we having to pay this? You know, are we strangers from God? Obviously, in a real sense, they were. Mm-hmm. But the whole point about Jesus's ministry is that it brings us into a real, authentic relationship with God. That's why Pete, That's what Jesus is saying. You know, he pays it for himself and for Peter. He pays it for us. You know? So that, I cannot stress enough how intimate and close that relationship between ourselves and God needs to be. We have to be his dear children as Colossians says. And to me, that is one of the big ideas of the New Testament. That's, you know, for for the Jews of Jesus's day, the one thing that represented God more than anything else was the temple. But it was impersonal. Mm -hmm. It was vast. But actually it suited everyone as well because it kept God at a distance. Mm -hmm. And, And our challenge is to be up close and personal with God, you know, to have God in our lives, to be his dear children. That's what Jesus came to do, to break down that wall of partition between us, you know, to tear the, the veil of the temple. And that's beyond religion. What is it that we need to do to become these beloved children of God? Well, um, Paul talks about this in Colossians 3, as dearly beloved children of God, holy, you know, and he goes through that whole list of things. I mean, okay, let's let's do some practical examples, you know. We have to live in the world in the in in the sense of the continual presence of God, aware that, you know, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we are in God's presence, to be conscious of that all the time. Mm-hmm. We have to invest other human beings with a sense of dignity and respect that comes from their being in God's image. One of the things that Jesus talks about in, you know, in the issue to do with the practice of religion is prayer. I don't know to what extent, you know, as a community, we've always emphasised the importance of reading the Bible. But, you know, what about the practice of prayer? Yes, we do it publicly, but what about on a personal level? You know, because public prayer may be necessary, but private prayer is essential for building a close and personal relationship with God. You know, we're all constantly affected by issues in our lives, concerns, problems. I mean, I have them. We all have them. You know, whether we're worried about our own personal situations, whether we're worried about, you know, members of our families, uh, you know, concerns about other people. You know, there are, there are always things to pray about, to bring them to the Father. And, of course, we have the, the Psalms in the Old Testament that give us examples of people doing, you know, the prayer of the, the overwhelmed, of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and he pours his complaint out before the Lord. 
just tells it to God how it is. You know, I think that's an experience that that's it's not unique to to us. I think it may also have been Jesus's experience too, to some degree, because um, because Jesus didn't have that sense. You know, in John chapter six, it tells us that he, after feeding the five thousand, you know, went into up into a high mountain and spent the whole night in prayer. You know, in in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest, it wasn't enough for him just to feel the presence of God there. He had to have people with him. You know, he said to the disciples, didn't he? You know, what, couldn't you watch with me one hour? You know? Very sad. It's yeah. Important. Yeah. Important. Yeah. So, so, yes, and of course, you know, there's always the, the you know, the, 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 the traditional answers about the fact that, you know, we can hear God speaking to us in the words of Scripture and, you know. But maybe maybe it's just that we need to cultivate a heart and a mind that makes us more sensitive to perhaps the presence of God in our lives. But sometimes, you know, it's a bit like the, the child or the, 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 the wife who, you know, offloads on her husband, you know, doesn't necessarily want him to fix it, you know. Obviously, we often do want God to fix things for us, but often it's 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 the it's the talking that's the important thing, and it may be that as we've as as, as you were relating earlier, um, you know, it's the process that we go through in order for a problem to be resolved that it's the real thing, you know. So we may need to learn patience, for instance, or humility, mm-hmm. you know, or whatever it is, you know. Yeah, and you know, I, I mean. Um, Obviously, you know, this day and age, there's a people talk about mindfulness and things like that, and they talk about you know meditation, all this sort of thing. Well, to me, prayer is meditation. It is mindfulness, but it is not mindfulness necessarily. Yes, it is about our own thoughts too, but rather than focusing on ourselves, we're focusing on something that's transcendent and something external to ourselves. So I, d- I do think that it is a very, if it's practiced, it can be a very healthy thing too. And we ought to regard it, I think, as as meditative as well. I mean, maybe sometimes prayers don't need words. Or maybe, you know, that prayer that the, that the publican offers up is a very short prayer, isn't it? God be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, so I think prayer is a very important part of this. But it's... But it's that relationship thing, isn't it? That's what it is. You know, that that's how we, that's how we have a relationship with the Father. You know, or at least one of the ways in which we have a relationship with God. But nothing else that acknowledges that he's there. Otherwise, what am I talking to? Right. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a question that's been around for a long time, I think. You know, but that silence... Or apparent silence is deliberate. Somebody once wrote. I was reading this recently that um, that if we if we had an experience of God, you know, mm-hmm. God in His fullness, our sense of of of, of moral choice would would be completely non-existent. Because basically, you know, if God was there, you know, we we would effectively have no choice. So it's the fact, you know, I mean, this is something that the book of Isaiah says, isn't it? Surely thou art a God that hidest thy face, O God of Israel. And maybe for us to be, for our love of God to be a voluntary thing, that's the way it has to be. Yeah. Yeah. But these are old these are old questions. I mean this is not just something that we've that we're wrestling with. One of the things that Paul says in Romans talking about the Jews he said that they were more interested in their own righteousness than the righteousness of God. What he meant by that was that they were more interested in their 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 own ideas of righteousness, what constituted righteousness. Mm-hmm. And of course, I'd like to suggest that what Jesus is attacking in Matthew 23 are those very notions of righteousness, which were all to do with externals rather than reality. 
It's a very human thing. The Jews did it in that particular way. We do it through a particular emphasis on, you know, things that you believe, you know, these sort of facts to do with the Bible, okay? But that's not the way the New Testament presents our relationship with God or our relationship with Christ. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not disputing for a moment that what's in the statement of faith in itself is correct, factually correct, of course it is. But that is not the basis of our relationship with God. 